Hi, everyone, and welcome to Anesthesia Coffee Break. And today we have a live Viva episode, which we're going to crack on with right away. You do your thing now. <laughs> now. All right, great. So, <laughs> um, so we're very excited today. We've got Mason. Mason's one of our Northwest uh, trainees who has kindly come in and um, to be offered to be given a Viva and, oh, in fact, in fact, to be to be Viva today. So Mason, tell us a bit about yourself. Yeah, thanks very much for having me along, guys. Uh, I've been a big fan of the podcast and the various things done by ABC's Manesthesia for a while. Um, it's always a good opportunity to have a couple of uh, uh, Vivas under a little bit more pressure than perhaps just doing it with your mates at work. Um, so yeah, very happy to get some extra experience. Um, looking forward to seeing the finished outcome. And can I ask you, Mason, it, this is kind of intimidating, right? You know, you're, you're, you're on a public forum being vibed. How do you feel okay about it? Because I, I know there's got, going to be lots of people out there who are, you know, it's, it sounds quite intimidating. What, what makes it okay for you? Um, I think inevitably the, throughout the entire preparation of this exam, you, you're pretty constantly humbled by your lack of knowledge when you meet people or, um, you know, particularly in the early phases of your studying when you see the trainees who are six months or 12 months ahead of you in their preparation and you're a little bit blown away by it um, and I think you just have to accept that you're never going to be delivering that perfect presentation but you, the only way you're going to get closer is doing things like this um, you know I, I know the two of you guys previously and there's a very small chance I'm going to know any of the examiners on the day so um, you know as much exposure to different people as possible is uh, only beneficial in my mind. And that's really good Mason I think that growth mindset where you talk about not being where you want to be, but eventually getting there. And I think that's what's um, going to make sort of the difference in terms of your success in life, because, you know, putting yourself out there and putting yourself in situations where you can feel like you can grow, this is essentially how you grow. I think the worst thing is when you, I, I, yeah, the worst thing is actually when you become a consultant, the, more, the higher up you get, the more you have, to lose reputationally in how you think other people perceive you so it doesn't get any better so you know. nothing to lose okay <laughs> <Good to know. laughs> all anyway, right let's so let's crack on so yep so we'll do proper viva style um you know five minutes per question four questions uh sam will start with a couple of his questions and right. i'll lead on so from there let's get started candidate six one i, sh I shouldn't say your number but you did say it in front of everyone so <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> everyone's gonna know all right so um what is fasting? Yep. Uh, so fasting is a state uh, where there is a cessation of nutritional intake. Um, uh, and therefore, after a period of time, the body relies on its own stores for uh, maintenance of energy supply to the tissues. And, and what is the difference between fasting and starvation? Um, so there's often a bit of a blend in the definitions between two, and there's a range of uh, time frame definitions, uh, but essentially it's, uh, there's a variation in the metabolic substrates involved, the hormone, the hormonal changes involved, uh, and therefore whether there's um, impacts on normal physiology. Okay. So, um, so you're having a patient fast for surgery. Uh, can you describe what the control of blood sugar would be or how, how it happens during these periods of fasting? Sure. Uh, so in the first sort of four to six hours after cessation of oral intake, uh, there still is some ongoing uptake of sort of uh, sugars, proteins and fats from the last meal that was consumed. Um, so at this stage, the body is actually in an anabolic phase. There tends to be high levels of insulin and lower levels of glucagon. Um, but as you progress past that period into the sort of six to 24 hour period, as blood sugar begins to fall, uh, this is detected uh, principally within the pancreas. Uh, there tends to be an increase in glucagon levels, a reduction in insulin, um, and then uh, mobilization of glucose stores from other reservoirs. Now, you mentioned insulin. So what, what other, um, are some of the other actions of insulin? Yeah, so insulin has both uh, sort of excitatory and inhibitory roles um, and has principal roles on uh, the liver, on fat and on muscle tissue. Uh, so within the liver, um, so insulin results in increased glucose uptake and increased conversion of glucose to glycogen. Um, it also promotes conversion of glucose into new fatty acids um, and triglycerides, which can then be transported to fat for storage. Um, its inhibitory roles in the liver include inhibition um, of gluconeogenesis and ketogenesis. Uh, in terms of its role in muscle and fat, there's increased glucose uptake by expression of GLUT4 transporters um, to promote uh, sort of utilization of readily available glucose by those tissues, um, as well as longer term storage. And 
how does it affect proteins? Um, so uh, insulin has uh, sort of a protein, uh, so an anabolic effect. Um, so it prevents protein breakdown uh, and facilitates protein um, uh, buildup. Okay. And then you mentioned glucagon. Uh, what are some of the actions of glucagon? Uh, so glucagon largely has polarizing actions to that of insulin. Um, so uh, glucagon results in breakdown of glycogen um, in the liver, um, which can then be released as glucose into the circulation. Um, it also facilitates um, a breakdown of glycogen in, fat, in muscle tissue. Um, however, this glucose is not able to be freely released into the circulation. Uh, it also tends to promote increased breakdown of fatty acids to use um, fat for, as a substrate for energy requirements. Um, and can promote uh, gluconeogenesis as well as ketogenesis with prolonged glucagon levels. Okay, now you mentioned that uh, glucagon increases fatty acid uh, synthesis. So what organs can use fatty acid uh, acids as a fuel source? Uh, yep, so um, importantly, so the heart, the skeletal muscle and fat tissue are able to use fatty acids as a metabolic substrate, um, but uh, the brain and red blood cells, importantly, are unable to do so and they require glucose for their metabolic needs. Okay, and hypothetically, let's say there is an inadequacy of glucose, mm. what happens then? Um, so an inadequacy of glucose um, uh, sort of results in some hormonal responses, uh, as we've alluded to earlier. So reduction in insulin, increase in glucagon can also result in an increase in catecholamine secretion to aim to increase um, blood sugar levels. Um, but then there can be sort of symptomatic effects of uh, being hypoglycemic. Um, uh, so there can be, a, sorry, interrupt me. That's all right. And then, so can they use any other substrate other than glucose, the brain? Um, so after prolonged periods of fasting, the brain is able to adapt to utilization of ketones um, for its metabolic needs, uh, but this usually requires a period of time for adaptation. And where do ketones come from? Uh, so ketones results when there's a prolonged period of fasting um, where there's an excess of fatty acids available um, that are then unable to enter into the Krebs cycle and instead they're diverted into um, ketone bodies, which can then be released into the circulation. And this is done in the liver. Okay, and then with the use of SGL2 inhibitors and fasting, why does that produce uh, ketoacidosis? Um, so uh, in this circumstance, uh, so there's actually, uh, uh, there's potentially a reduction in blood sugar levels, um, uh, but in the fasting state, there's an increase in glucagon levels. Um, so. Uh, even though there is uh, potentially glucose available in the circulation uh, because there's a lack of insulin to facilitate the uptake into the relevant tissues, uh, this is effectively uh, an, in, an inadequacy of uh, glucose within the liver, which can promote um, then fatty acid breakdown and ketone production. Okay. Um, now, you are doing a peripheral nerve block with a lignocaine. How does lignocaine prevent... Um, the nerve action potential? So lignocaine and other local anesthetics act as um, they by causing blockade of the fast voltage gated sodium channels within nerve and cardiac muscle. Um, so uh, first, uh, these, this requires the drug to be in its uh, unionized form, um, which uh, typically is only a small proportion given local anesthetics of weak bases. Um, this unionized form is then able to diffuse across the plasma membrane. It is then ionized inside the cell, at which point it can block the voltage gated sodium channels, uh, which is responsible for depolarization. What are the ways uh, that you can modify the onset of local anesthetic or lignocaine in this, in this case? Sure. Um, so there are both some clinical factors and probably some drug factors that can be considered. Uh, and most of these sort of relate to fixed law of diffusion. Um, so you know, in general, giving a larger dose will facilitate a larger concentration gradient for uptake into the relevant nerve. Um, uh, in terms of uh, potentially co-administering the drug with something like sodium bicarbonate to alkalinize the local area, increase the unionized proportion, therefore giving a larger diffusible fraction. Um, using things like ultrasound guided techniques to ensure that the local anesthetic is delivered as close as possible to the relevant nerve um, and often giving a larger volume uh, to increase the surface area of exposure can facilitate faster uptake. Um, additionally, using adrenaline allows you to give a higher dose, which may then facilitate faster onset. Okay. Now, what other other uses or why, why, why do we often use adrenaline with lignocaine? 
Uh, so adrenaline has um, benefits both for the sort of the onset and the duration of effect. Um, so the onset, as I've said before, is it allows you to increase your max dose from sort of um, three milligrams per kilo to seven milligrams per kilo with lignocaine. Um, in terms of the duration of effect, um, so by causing local vasoconstriction, this decreases the systemic uptake of lignocaine and therefore keeps it uh, predominantly within the tissue that it's been injected to, um, and therefore prolongs its duration of action. What are the issues if you get systemic absorption of lignocaine? Um, so systemic uptake of lignocaine uh, has the potential to cause um, local anaesthetic systemic toxicity. Um, that being said, lignocaine is a relatively safe local anaesthetic uh, of the options available. Okay. And you, so you mentioned some uh, toxic effects. What, what are they? Um, so uh, toxic effects of the local anaesthetics in general. Yeah, okay, of lignocaine, includes... sorry. Of, of lignocaine. Um, yeah. So following a, a peripheral nerve block, um, so really systemic uptake is the main area of toxicity I'd be concerned about. Um, so there are generally uh, neurological and cardiovascular consequences. Uh, the neurological can be both excitatory or inhibitory, and there are a range of phases of cardiovascular impairment. Yeah. Which one happens first? So neurological effects typically happen earlier. And which one happens in terms of excitatory or inhibition? Um, so the excitatory effects occur first, so these are things like tinnitus, perioral tingling or blurred vision, um, then seizures can occur, but later the inhibitory effects like sedation, coma or respiratory depression can predominate. And what's the mechanism? Um, so in this case, uh, the local anesthetics acts as much like they do on peripheral nerves. And so inhibition of uh, voltage-gated sodium channels prevents normal neuronal conduction and activity. Um, the reason for the uh, initial excitatory phase is that they inhibit inhibitory interneurons earlier, and then later they have a more widespread depressive effect. Now, when giving a spinal, why do we use heavy bupivacaine? What does heavy mean to you in this, in this, uh, in this case? So heavy in this uh, scenario means that there is um, some additional glucose, which is added to the local anesthetic solution, uh, which means that it has a higher specific gravity than that of the cerebrospinal fluid. Um, this facilitates a gravitational effect of the local anesthetic, which can be used to manipulate the block with patient positioning. And what do you mean by specific gravity? Um, I don't know if I can give you a definition for that, sorry. Yeah, that's okay. Um, and then what are its effects of, oh, what, what are the effects of using plain bupivacaine versus heavy bupivacaine? Uh, so there are a couple of effects largely related to the distribution of the drug after being injection, injected. Um, so uh, plain bupivacaine tends to have um, less uh, sort of cranial spread compared to um, hyperbaric bupivacaine, uh, and it is not able to be altered significantly by positioning of the patient. Um, it's therefore commonly associated with less hemodynamic instability than hyperbaric solutions, um, but may produce a narrower field of block. Okay, so we'll move on to Lahiru now. Okay. Just let that siren go past. Perfect timing to let you know that uh, we're halfway. <laughs> That's right. Okay, let's say you have a person with normal physiology, say a 50 year old, otherwise healthy person. What happens if you block the left main bronchus? Okay, um, so if the left main bronchus uh, is obstructed, um, then uh, immediately there is no ventilation being delivered to that, the entirety of that lung, um, which uh, immediately this would um, start to contribute uh, an area of shunt where there is provision but no ventilation. Um, I say immediately, but there would be a small period where there is ongoing gas exchange from the reserves in that lung. Um, now, this doesn't tend to cause significant hypoxemia in healthy patients with normal physiology because of the effects of hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. Mm -hmm. How much shunt would that be? Uh, so um, initially, if not for the effects of hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction, uh, I guess this would be approximately 50% shunt. Mm -hmm. What would you expect the oxygen saturations to be? Uh, so if uh, if the shunt was uh, not corrected, it was still 50%, uh, I expect the SATs to be close to the mixed venous value of around 75% uh, and then declining rapidly from there. Uh, as in, let's say uh, th this patient, um, ev everything else was working fine, all the other compensatory me mechanisms were working, what would you expect the SATs to be in this patient? 
Um, so if they were able to effectively reduce the blood flow to this now uh, blocked off lung, um, uh, I'd probably expect a small decrease. Um, I'd probably have to try and calculate the exact shunt percentage that they've achieved, um, but I'd still expect them to have relatively normal SATs in a healthy individual, sort of, you know, in the range of 90 to 95%. What would cause the SATs to decrease? Uh, so in this circumstance, um, the arterial uh, oxygen saturations decrease because there is areas of mixed venous blood, which is passing through non-ventilated areas of lung, this shunted tissue, um, and then effectively diluting out the pulmonary and capillary blood with this low oxygen content mixed venous blood. So what would make, if a healthy person would have relatively normal saturations, what would cause, a, what would be the cause of a decreasing SATs in this context? Um, um, can you re-clarify the question? Sorry, La. Yeah. What would what uh, what situation would make you would make you expect the saturations to decrease in a healthy person? They're roughly maintained. What factors would make this the sets decrease? Sure. Um, so anything which uh, so if patients have a failure um, of hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction, um, so this can be worsened. Um, uh, so if, particularly in exposure to volatile anaesthetics or other intravenous anaesthetics. Um, uh, can be worsened if patients are hypocapnic or alkalemic as well. Any other things that affect hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction? Uh, so, yeah, administration of any systemic um, or pulmonary vasodilators um, would also affect this process. Like what? Um, so, um, so uh, this could include things like um, uh, you know, GTN, uh, nit nitrovasodilators, um, potentially um, alpha blocking agents like would be lol or phentolamine um, or uh, sort of inodilators like milarinone. How do you calculate shunt? Uh, so I would do this using the shunt equation. Um, I can try and draw it out for you as soon as you'd like. <laughs> oh yeah, or you can describe it. Sure. Um, so essentially, it describes that the shunt flow divided by the total flow through the pulmonary circulation, which therefore is equal to the shunt fraction, uh, is equal to the content of pulmonary uh, end capillary blood minus the arterial oxygen content. And then this is the numerator, and then the denom denominator is uh, end capillary blood minus mixed venous uh, oxygen content. And how do you calculate each of those components? Uh, so the arterial levels can be calculated by taking an arterial blood gas, um, measuring the partial pressure of oxygen, as well as the hemoglobin saturation, and then plugging this into the oxygen content equation, uh, which is 1.34 times hemoglobin concentration times saturation uh, plus 0 0.03 times the partial pressure. Um, a mixed venous sample would also need to be corrected uh, using a pulmonary artery catheter in the pulmonary artery. Um, and then the pulmonary uh, end capillary blood, uh, that value can't be directly measured, uh, but can be calculated uh, by application of the alveolar gas equation. Mm -hmm. What is venous admixture? So this is a physiological concept, uh, which describes the volume of uh, mixed venous blood, which would need to be added to pulmonary end capillary blood to produce the observed difference um, in arterial oxygen content. And how is this different to shunt? Uh, so shunt um, truly defines areas of lung with a VQ ratio um, equal to zero, um, whereas venous admixture uh, is contributed to by components of both shunt or areas of VQ mismatch. How does VQ mismatch contribute to this venous admixture? So areas of the lung with low VQ ratios effectively are underventilated for the amount of blood flow to those regions. Um, this therefore results in a reduction in the alveolar oxygen content, um, and therefore the blood leaving these areas of the lungs has a lower partial pressure of oxygen and a lower saturation as well. Back to that case, if you block the left main bronchus, um, what would you expect the cardiovascular changes to be? Um, so uh, initially, um, so I would expect uh, the normal response of um, increasing pulmonary vascular resistance in the left lung, um, which would therefore cause an increase um, in blood flow as it's diverted into the right lung. Um, the, this might overall produce a slight increase in the total pulmonary vascular resistance and an increase in pulmonary artery pressures to overcome this. Um, but uh, I would not expect significant changes in sort of left ventricular um, uh, cardiac outputs, uh, perhaps a slight reduction. Okay, we'll go to the next section. What is MAC? 
So this is the minimum alveolar concentration of an inhaled anesthetic agent, which is required to produce immobility in response to a standard surgical stimulus in 50% of adult patients under standardized conditions. How do you use it? Uh, so it has utility in both comparing the anesthetic potency of different inhaled anesthetics. Um, it can also be used uh, for um, the additive nature of different uh, anesthetic agents. Um, and there are also subtypes of MAC, which can be clinically useful, like MAC bar or um, uh, MAC 95. So what is MAC bar? So this is the minimum alveolar concentration um, required to cause blunting of the adrenergic response, um, typically either to surgical stimulation or to laryngoscopy. Uh, and it's usually about 1.5 to two times the MAC for a given agent. In MAC 95? Uh, so MAC95 is the minimum alveolar concentration required to produce immobility uh, in 95% of the population instead of 50%. Mm -hmm. And what's MAC-AWAKE? Uh, so MAC-AWAKE is the MAC required to prevent uh, sort of uh, voluntary uh, obeying of commands, typically eye-opening, in response to verbal stimuli. And it's usually about 0.3 MAC for a given agent. Mm -hmm. And you said it's about 0.3 MAC. Why is, why is it about 0.3 MAC? Um, so there is some variation between agents. Uh, the most notable difference is that uh, nitrous oxide uh, has a MAC awake of about 0.6. What is the MAC in an 80-year-old person? Uh, so most MAC values are derived for sort of 40-year-old um, fit, healthy, well patients. Um, there tends to be a reduction in MAC requirements with increasing age. I think there's ballpark about a 7% reduction in MAC for each decade after 40 years old. Um, so, you know, a 28% reduction for, for um, from 40 years up to 80. Um, so, for example, for Cefluorane with a MAC of in a 40 year old of 2%, um, this might get down to a MAC of about um, sort of 1.6% uh, in an 80 year old. Okay. What is the MAC of ISO? 1.15%. Uh, and what would be that MAC in an eight year old, roughly? Uh, I probably need my calculator out, but no, yeah, right. more back, it's going to be around about um, sort of 0 0.9, 0 0.95 MAC uh, percent, sorry. Mm -hmm. does, does MAC display any changes on induction versus coming out of, it, coming out of um, anesthesia? Uh, yeah, so some sort of hysteresis can be generated or demonstrated in the dose response curves for anesthetic agents. Um, and this is sometimes described as MAC awake versus MAC unawake, uh, where typically patients will wake up at a lower end tidal concentration uh, than is required for them to initially go off to sleep. Why is that? Uh, I think the proposed theories relate to the amount of sort of excitatory and neurotransmitter activity within the brain. You know, under anesthesia, you're waking up from a state of relatively little um, neurological input compared to going off to sleep while you're stressed and you've got a lot of neuronal activity occurring. Is there any other reasons why the MAC that you measure from your end tidal concentration would display hysteresis? Uh, to some extent, uh, most MAC values are derived for the anesthetic concentrations at steady state. Um, and during both induction and emergence, uh, these gases have not uh, often come close to their steady state yet. So the measurements at the alveolus uh, may not always reflect that at the brain. Mm -hmm. So why does MAC reduce in with age? Um, uh, I don't know off the top of my head, but I guess from first principles, uh, there tends to be um, you know, a general reduction in function of uh, many systemic tissues with increasing age, and this includes the neurological system. Um, so there can be um, a reduction in, um, in sort of excitatory neurotransmitter activity um, and potentially uh, a reduction in the integrity of the blood-brain barrier. How does MAC change in paediatrics from birth, neonates and older? Yeah, so uh, MAC is said to be at its highest um, at around about six months of age. Um, so it's slightly less in a neonate compared to a six month old infant, um, but then reduces at a relatively linear fashion uh, with increasing age after this time. Okay, so what is the MAC at six months? Uh, so at six months old, um, I think it can be in the so say for sevoflurane, um, I think the MAC yeah, is sort of in the range of three or even a little bit higher percent. Okay, that's the end. Thank you. How do you feel, Mason? Well done. Uh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> I think you did exceptionally well. That was such, such a strong vibe. <laughs> that was really good. And, and you exhibited some really nice techniques. Uh, 
which I sort of listened to when you were um, being vibed by La. So things like, um, I think you asked La to clarify a question. So that, that's really good. And, um, and, th and that's a really good uh, sort of skill to have in order to have that confidence to ask the examiner, well, can, I, can I just ask you to rephrase that question? And instead of sort of jumping in and answering a question which you're sort of unsure of, and allowed you to sort of give you a bit of time to also think and allowed to also rephrase that question. And you answered that question really, really well. So that was really good. And then the second part, which I really liked was when Lars sort of asked you about um, uh, the reasons why Mac was sort of changing with age, how you said, look, I'm not sure, but from first principles and do you know what? It sounded, sounded mm. absolutely correct. So that was really <laughs> good. I, and you know, worked it out and it really showed that you've got that understanding uh, and it really nice sort, sort of float really, really nicely. What are your thoughts, Bla? Yeah, there's some the subtle things that you're doing, like, are, are just really good. I, I mean, I, I don't know if it's learnt or not, but, you know, often you went very quickly with a category and then you went straight into some detail. You didn't waste any time. Like, and then, and then just, just the way you went through, you know, you, we talked about you, you went straight to the point of Shan. That's probably the biggest part of that. So you went straight to that, describing what that is. And then you quickly gave, a lot of information, which was actually the next few questions. I was running out of answers. I was like, running out of questions to give you. I just started making stuff up. So, you know, to pass the time really <laughs> and give the audience something worthwhile, you know, to, to see that took up five minutes. Yeah. Uh, so that was done really well, but I, I, yeah, I've got, to, I've got to echo what Stan said. If you don't know something, people do get flustered by it, but there's something really, I think, pleasing to me. And obviously Stan about someone saying, oh, I'm not sure, but I'm going to make something that sounds reasonable to try to get some points out, trying to get some marks and move on. So yeah, I, was, I was really, yeah, I was really happy with that. Um, you, every, everything was pretty sharp in terms of all your numbers and your values, the way you're kind of deriving things. Often in this exam, for example, you know, the shunt equation, often they'll ask you these questions about how do you actually derive these values? And you had some really slick information about that, which was, which was great. Even describing that, that um, equation, you know, the fact that you're saying things like, the numerator is this, the denominator is this. It's, it's very easy for us to imagine that. And, you know, who, who knows if this exam goes to a, um, a Zoom format eventually yeah. or whatever, <laughs> you know, your ability to communicate diagrams and equations succinctly and well will be a whole other skill. So I thought that was really good. I don't think I've actually done a single in-person Viva in my preparation so far, but I've done about 50 Zoom ones. So <laughs> at this stage, it's almost hoping it'll be a Zoom format. <laughs> I think so too, yeah. So. Yeah. It's almost inevitable, isn't it? Just where, where we are, but that's that's a discussion for another yeah another, actually, another podcast. Actually, there, there was something I've been uh, I was I was thinking about. You know, as we we're moving into Zoom, no, no longer is it when we're doing things in person, you have to present yourself well. You dress up in a suit, you get your hair cut, maybe make sure that you've had a shower that that week, uh, and then you and, and then you go in for the vibe. But now, imagine we are doing everything on Zoom. Now it really is about making your environment look good so that someone that's looking on that screen, whether you're being interviewed or examined, looks at that image and goes, oh, yep, I like that. It's that first impression type thing. So uh, I, I think this is one of those things that will probably evolve into the future, but getting your setting looking good, looking pleasing. Uh, obviously, look, I, suspect, um, yeah, I suspect they'll have it, they'll, have, they'll be zooming in a, in a, um, hmm. uh, in a center, which is supervised. So I think yeah, they'll true, have true. Like a standard, yeah. Like a standard. I don't have to recall uh, the posters wall just yet yeah yeah you can't, you can't be like have that little background of the beach or <laughs> that's right have your cat walking past and... yeah. <laughs> um so yeah really good stuff so go, go through a couple of things with uh, my vibes very strong answered everything really well um there yeah and and i think you picked up the nuance between sort of fasting and and starvation and you hear that sometimes in terms of what's the difference between fasting and what's the difference in starvation so uh, so starvation is the absolute or relative uh, inadequacy in terms of caloric energy intake and you can describe it in terms of starch and often they describe like a little time so more than sort of 48 hours whereas fasting they just say just refrain, refraining from eating and that's actually quite physiological like we fast when we sleep and um, and most often the, the fast that we require our patients to undertake can is tolerated very very well and you describe that really well in terms of how the body adapts to fasting and how um, it's able to control the blood sugar just with the normal absorption of food that's undertaken during that period and just just before you actually start fasting um, and really strong in terms of the actions of insulin and glucagon you summarize that really well 
and you know your, your pace and the way that you're able to also stop as well that that was really good because i think one of the key things about a lot of trainees is that they just tend to go on and on and on whereas you were very good very succinct and sort of knew when to sort of uh, stop and move on to the next question uh and i think the the only tricky bit was because you were, you were doing so well i asked you about sgl2i inhibitors and how and its effects on fasting and um how it produces ketoacidosis so yeah it's really got two mechanisms so one one affects uh the pancreas and one affects the kidneys so the pancreas in its in its simplest summarized form increases glucagon decreases insulin and you know the effects of glucagon um, and insulin with increased glucagon you get increased uh, ketogenesis versus uh, a reduction in insulin okay yeah. and then with kidneys what it does is it inc it increases glycosuria and increases uh your sodium re uh sorry decreases your sodium reabsorption so it increases the amount of sodium that's being excreted and in doing that it actually increases the amount of ketones that are being reabsorbed so those two interplays actually increases uh, your ketone, your ketone bodies in blood, okay? Um, and, and that's also why you get the euglycemia, because even though you've got glucagon trying to increase your glucose or increase the amount of um, glucose in the blood, you've actually got your SGL2Is causing glucose glycosuria. So it's actually getting rid of that glucose. And so that's why you get that uh, euglycemic diabetic ketoacidosis or diabetic mm -hmm. ketoacidosis, not diabetic. Um, and then with the local anesthetic, again, very, very strong. And again, uh, sort of that last sort of bit of question is, is always a question that's always very difficult. And, and again, run out of questions and we're really sort of pushing you when we sort of asking you what is bericity and what is specific gravity. So bericity is, and an, it's very analogous to specific gravity, but what bericity explains or what bericity describes, it's the ratio of densities of local anesthetic and CSF. Whereas when you talk about specific gravity, it's talking about the ratio of the of a substance uh, to a standard, where the standard is often uh, water at four degrees. So when when you say that, yeah, when you go specific gravity of um, of heavy bupivacaine is one point um, one point oh two six, what you're saying is that it has a density one point oh two six more than water at four degrees, okay? So the local anesthetic is compared to water at four degrees. Whereas when we go bericity, what we're comparing is the local anesthetic to CSF. CSF. Yeah. Correct, yeah. Oh, that's good. Um, and again, I, di I didn't have too much to add to that because I think you answered really solid. In terms of the the one thing, uh, in terms of the de decrement of MAC per decade, I've got 6% as my value. The fact that you said 7%, I don't, I don't care too much. Uh, and, uh, you know, roughly comes to about 0.7, which you, yeah, correct, correctly alluded to um, at that age, 0.7 max. So otherwise, I thought, yeah, again, very strong. And I'm just really happy with the way you're going, the way you're answering these questions. So well done. All right. No, thank you both very much. Um, I'm uh, very glad to have had the opportunity to come on. Excellent. Actually, you know what we do? We, we started asking the last person was, um, do you have a performance tip? Something that you, you're you glad you learned, something you've been doing that has helped you learn well? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so I think uh, Catherine, who was on last time, was actually in my study group and she talked about the, the benefits of having a great study group and uh, yeah. I would certainly reiterate that. Uh, for me, I found something that, and I don't know, think this would work for everyone, but I sort of scheduled myself pretty significantly. You know, we had a study plan 10 months out and we knew exactly what we were doing every week for the first sort of eight months of that time period. Um, but even when I'd sit down on, you know, a Saturday or a Sunday and have a day that was a study day, you know, I would only ever study for 50 minutes at a time. I'd have regular breaks in between because otherwise you could just find yourself going down these rabbit holes with mm -hmm. so many different areas of content. Um, so I'd say, you know, for this 50 minutes, I'm doing this topic. For the next 50 minutes, I'm doing another topic. And for me, that kind of created a degree of urgency sometimes and actually kept me a bit, a bit more engaged in different topics. And it meant that if I ran out and I didn't get through a topic, but it was interesting to me, then I could spend you know extra time on that. And it was almost strange that it was almost a reward to be allowed to study a certain topic for more than the allocated time. Um, that's, which, that's interesting. So 50 minutes, then it was a 10 minute break and then another 50, 10 minute break like that. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. So I'd usually do that. Uh, I would usually I'd sit down for, for a four hour period. I'd do 50 minutes, I'd have a 10 minute break, another 50, then a 20 minute break, another 50, then 10, another 50, and then have a meal. 
Um, so I reckon I've done about a thousand laps of the block outside my house in the last couple of months. <laughs> and um, was that a particular formula or something you learned from someone else or? I think that when I, I, I found that I think I'd done 45 and 15 when I was studying for my year 12 exams and it yep. worked reasonably well. So, you know, I gave it a try earlier and definitely, you know, when I first started studying for this exam, it was really hard to sit down and not look at your phone or not check your emails for even half an hour. Mm. Um, and so by sort of picking a time and sticking to it um, and, you know, my phone was always either off or on silent during those times, it was, you know, dedicated study time. It wasn't casual because mm. um, I didn't want to, I'd rather do sort of, you know, four hours of focused study than eight hours of, you know, half engaged, half on and off, because it meant that I still got some uh, some free time at the end of it. Interesting, because um, uh, we referenced this person before, Patsy Tremaine, she's a exam, you know, performance mm -hmm. psychologist and also does exam training. And she talks about doing that, you know, your morning's your best time to study, do four hours, 50 minutes on, 10 minutes off, repeat that for four yeah. hours. And then make sure that in the afternoon you're just doing other stuff because that's usually when your circadian rhythm's kind of down and you're a bit sleepier and you can't really take much. Definitely. And then save the evenings for exam practice because then you're a bit more fatigued and you, you want to try and replicate the exam. So I thought that was an interesting thing that you mentioned because that's that pretty much what she said with all her experience as well. I have heard Patsy Utrain talk before, so maybe I've just forgotten where I got my details from and that's actually <laughs> not me giving her enough credit. <laughs> maybe. Well, she's got it now. Yeah. Excellent. Right. Yeah. And then, hey, what are you looking forward to after uh, this exam? Uh, to, to be honest, it's um, particularly with the situation here in Victoria, it's <laughs> very really, really difficult to travel, um, anticipate too trips. much. Yeah, traveling is not going to be not going to be on the cards for a little while. Oh, um, okay. I think uh, to, to a certain extent, I've, I've recently moved hospitals to a, a larger tertiary institution. Um, and, you know, work is a big part of what we can actually still do at the moment. And I guess as healthcare workers are pretty lucky to still be able to um, go to work. And so I'm at the Austin Hospital at the moment, which does some massive, incredible surgical um, and anaesthetic uh, stuff. So when I'm not constantly looking for every spare moment to cram in some Viva practice or some flashcard sessions, it'll uh, be good to be engaged in a slightly more involved uh, work environment. Oh, that's great. Fantastic. <laughs> well, why don't we wrap it up for there? Uh, so thank you everyone thank you very much mason for coming along and having us exam examine you and hopefully this is very useful for anyone who's listening to see what potentially real vibe it sounds like and so please yeah share with share this with anyone if you have any questions please email us at lahira and stan at gmail.com of course we've started our patreon so please look, if you feel like giving to this cause and all the all the donations will go to its funder fellow please do so at the link in the story notes and as always thank you and see you again next time thanks guys